from the number one best-selling author of Life Rescripted. You're now tuning in to the Year of Purpose podcast. I'm Zephan Moses Blacksburg. James Miller is a licensed psychotherapist and piano composer who resides in West Palm Beach, Florida. He has been in the mental health field for 20 years, working in all types of settings from prisons to residential treatment centers, outpatient clinics, universities, uh, and many, many others, and was most recently in a private practice in Washington, D.C. for the last 10 years. He personally was not feeling fulfilled in his practice and knew there was a next step of growth and development in his own path. He started to create an augmented version of who he wanted to be based on the idea of being location independent. He formulated his dreams around the concept and was able to actualize the plan by creating James Miller Lifeology. Instead of continuing psychotherapy for individuals and couples, he felt he wanted Wanted to focus on areas in people's lives that are already going well and making them even better. And I think this is something that we all could really focus on a lot more of because it's so easy, James, for people to look at what's going wrong or what's not working. It's much harder to pick out the things that you actually want to do. So James, thanks for being here today. And uh, I really appreciate you spending some time. And I know that our weather is catching up to yours. You're down in <laughs> Florida. It just got That's... warm here today. The first day I could wear flip-flops. So I'm a little little jealous oh, that you great. had that for the last few months, but uh, thanks for being here. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate that. So, you know, I'd love to give people just a little bit of a background because, you know, you're also a piano composer and, yes. <laughs> and a licensed therapist, and how do you get to lifeology from these things? So I'd love to just share a little bit of your background, you know, where does the musical side come in, and then where does the more scientific and human side come in? Sure. Well, I started um, in music when I was actually three years old. I started voice lessons, and then when I was in grade three, I started piano lessons, and it just went on. And I actually was going to be a geneticist. That's what I wanted to be when I went into undergrad, but then it changed, and I got a huge music scholarship. So I changed to um, to vocal and piano performance, and then switched from that to psychology with a Spanish <laughs> major. I mean, it was all over the place. And so, but I have just, you know, like many people, I have very divergent interests and I was blessed to be good at some of those. And so it just kind of happened from there. And so I went ahead and I was going to do something. I wanted to be in the film industry and, and all those things. And, but I thought, you know, let me make a decision to at least get my master's degree in counseling. And then if things change, then I'll go back and maybe do something different. And it never happened. I, was very successful in the psychotherapy world and that just came became bigger and bigger and um with that you know my dream was to, to still compose music i hadn't composed for probably about five or six years and then i some transformations were happening in my life and i literally sat down one day and i just started composing and it flowed out of me in such such a wonderful way and with that my first album was released it's um it was 10 original compositions. And so if you listen to it, it's more like a movie soundtrack, that type of, of piano, um, piano music. And so that's just kind of what's happened for me, you know, in, in the bio that you read about me. Um, I've, I've been very successful in one thing. And so now this whole transformation for me coming down to West Palm Beach and doing something that I really enjoy. Um, you know, I think a lot of the times mediocrity is something that we all kind of feel and we experience but I was able to say you know what I'm I'm I've been successful in what I was doing but now it's time for something different and so that's when I created whole the whole concept of lifeology and was able to actualize it with my whole plan of being location independent I didn't want to be kind of centralized in an office I want to be able to go anywhere I can in the world and do what I'm doing and that's how everything came about and then I chose West Palm Beach, told myself I'd be here for a year, and then we'll see what happens after that. Very nice. Well, you know, I think you picked the best place for weather. Um, <laughs> I love that you brought up flow because that's something that we actually don't talk about very often is getting into flow. So we could maybe dive into that in just sure. a moment. But sure. another big thing that you brought up too that's super important is that uh, I really resonate with you saying how you went into the therapy world became very good and successful at it and then ultimately realized you know this is not fulfilling like it's one thing to make a really good paycheck and it's mm -hmm. it's another thing to really enjoy what you're doing um that isn't to say that uh you know someone would hate what they're doing to have to make a change i think that exactly. you can like other things more than what you're currently doing and you know i was certainly in the same boat when the podcast came about i had been in my video business and while i was very very good at it and had honed in on one skill uh, i 
think that the world the way it is now allows us to do more than one thing versus Certainly. the way the school system was kind of made. And I've talked about this with other people. It, the school system was kind of built upon that World War II era of like you're supposed mm-hmm. to focus on one thing and that's just what you do. So what happens when you get to that moment, especially for you, where you were like, I've been doing this for 10 years and I'm just not going to do this anymore. Like, what does that look like? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. You know, specifically for me, my practice was, was very was flourished, and I would see about thirty clients a week, and it was just going really well. But there was something inside of me that said, you know, I really enjoy what I'm doing, but and I'm helping everybody else, but I'm not necessarily develop. I'm not growing internally, and so I was like, well, what would that look like, James? Should you develop more? Should you grow more? And with that, I wanted to find things and really create things for myself where I was being fulfilled in all areas of my life. You know, a lot of the, the you know, the financial component was, was I was flourishing there with the, the success, if you will, I was flourishing there. But my own creative side was not flourishing. And so it was, it was time for me to time, kind of take a step back and, and look at what that looks like. And so one of the things I typically do is I usually create like a graph. And in that graph, what I do is I look at all the different areas of my life and try to break it down as much as possible. So that can be like uh, my time with friends, relationships, finances, health and wellness, and creating all of those kind of uh, little categories. And then I usually rate it from one to 10. And so that really gives me a good snapshot in the moment of where I'm being fulfilled. And I found when I did that, that I was not being fulfilled in some of these areas of my life. And I was really surprised by that because, you know, like we said, you when you're really good at something, you, you think that everything's going really well. And so when I took that snapshot, I said, well, these things are really important to me that aren't really flourishing. So how would I make that different? And so that's when I really started to reformulate the plan for myself. You know, one of the things when it comes to the, to the psychology world is – we tend to focus on the things that are not going well in someone's life. You know, typically when someone would come to me in my practice, they would tell me everything that's going wrong. And I would try and reframe it to say, well, what is going well? And when someone is so consumed with something that feels so overwhelming to them, it's hard for them to find a different reframe of what that looks like. You know, you take a coin and the closer you bring it to your eye, that's all you're going to see. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes when people get so overwhelmed that that was all they would see. And so, you know, specifically with me, things weren't going bad in my life, but I just found myself kind of being consumed with everyone's struggles and difficulties that I was helping them through that. But then on my own personal life, I just wasn't growing in the personal areas of my own development. And so one of the things about lifeology is to, is to work with people who are already successful and make them even more successful, find those things that are going well and making it even better. So that's why I'm, I'm pretty much my own client when it comes to that as well. It's helping myself reframe a situation and building on those things that are already going well. Yeah, and it sounds like it was really asymmetrical at one point in time. You know, you spend so much time and effort trying to help and impact the outside world that Mm -hmm. you almost miss out on, you know, your inside world. And this was something similar that happened to me, too, when I was working for the Apple store fixing iPhones day after day. People would come in and they're like, oh, do you see this all the time? You know, like, do you like working here? And I'm like, well... People bring me broken stuff, and every mm-hmm. 10 minutes I take a new appointment and I see an upset person. No one comes in and sure. makes an appointment just to say, thank you, I love this product. Like, <laughs> exactly. My job is to basically <laughs> see broken stuff and mm-hmm. angry people all day. Sure. And so I know what that's like to be the person who has to like stay strong and be energetic and inspire other people outwards mm-hmm. when inside you're just kind of like you have this soul crushing feeling in the back sure. of your spine. And um, that was one thing I re- really do is, you know, for myself, I had really good self care and I implemented that and it went really well. So I was able to keep those boundaries. But when, you know, when you look at the, the create, the creativity part of my life or the creative part of my life, when it came to composing, I hadn't really done that. So that was not something that was in me. So I thought, you know, I've helped people for so long and I loved it and I'm good at it, but now it's time for me. And so for me to make that reframe and make that switch, and I've just been so happy in doing it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. And I mean, how many people do you think are out there right now who had some sort of creative thing that they did as a kid or a teenager, or even just, you know, in their twenties or thirties, and they kind of moved away from it for whatever reason, whether it was Mm -hmm. starting a family or, you know, the work-life balance got in the way. And I mean, how many of them do you think if they just went back to basics and went back to those core things that they loved so much, it would just change their life? 
I think pretty much everybody has experienced that at some part in their life, and not everybody is aware of it. You know, I, we all have our own special gifts, and some are very obvious. You know, for example, if someone is, you know, a, a professional actor and, you know, they're on TV all the time, versus someone who just has a gift of compassion, you know, that's not as obvious. But we all have that. And I think when people just get caught up in the minutia of life and aren't really really mindful of what's happening internally, then we just forget about those gifts and we think, oh, well, this is how my life is going to be. This is how it's always going to be. And then they forget that part and they're never really fully, they never really fully develop. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, let me ask you, because it sounds like, you know, you had been in your practice for 10 years and it became Mm -hmm. successful. A lot of the people that come to me tend to be in jobs where they're not as financially well off, like they're Mm -hmm. still struggling in a sense. So I'm curious to hear your perspective on, you know, it's one thing if we left a job where we had built up a really nice savings and we're comfortable and could like start a new venture or business. (laughs) What would you recommend for the people who are still kind of stuck in that job? They're not making a whole lot. They're still going paycheck to paycheck, but they want to make that change. They want to make that leap, but there's kind of that fear that's coming into play of, you know, what do I do if I don't make this money? And we play that what if game. Sure. Well, you know, one of the things that I did was I started this plan about a year and a half ago. And so I've actually been here in West Palm Beach since um, April of last year. And so a year and a half prior to that is when I started my plan. So I think one of the things that many people struggle with is, they have an idea of what they want to do, but it's not fully mapped out. And I don't mean that you have to think about you know every nuance of what's going to happen, but there needs to be steps that you roll out. I mean, we always have – what I typically teach people is we often put together, superimpose two things. It comes to um, we're in the information gathering stage, and then all of a sudden we think – Information gathering then means action. And so if I if I get this information about something like, oh my gosh, I have to make this decision now. And sometimes that fear kicks in and we often will execute a plan without really thinking it through and trying to get as much information as possible. So I think if people are in a job where they're struggling, there's a difference between saying, okay, well, what's the direction I want to go? So how can, let's say you're in, in a job that's that I'm just randomly going to make this up. Uh, You're an accounting job, but you want to just help people for a living. So on the weekends, what would you do on the weekend? How can you invest at least a half hour of something? So when you can start to invest your time in something that that is in the direction you want to go, it slowly then starts to take on a life of its own. But so many times people have this concept of what they want to do. But they don't even start out in the small steps. They take this huge leap, and sometimes that works. But when, but when they don't practice and plan everything out, then there's this huge gap between that, and that's typically when people fail. And I'm sure it's so easy to self-sabotage, especially in an accounting role where you could say, oh, well, you know, it's tax season, so mm-hmm. I really, I don't have weekends. But the funny thing is tax season doesn't last all year. It only I... lasts for a couple months. And I think that people are very quick to uh, just jump to an excuse and say, oh, I can't accomplish this because blank. And I know that uh, you talk a lot about this three-second rule and self-sabotage. Mm-hmm. Could you share a little bit more about that? Sure. So we the way I the way I usually teach things is so we're made up of three parts. So we have our spirit, mind, and body. And I don't mean in a religious sense. I mean our body is a corporal part of us that we work on every day. You know, our diet and exercise. Our mind is a logical component that helps us. It gives us the reasoning and the logic. And then the spiritual part of us is the part of us that gives us that hope. It's kind of like that cheerleader, that encourager. And so one of the things I really teach people is what I call the three second rule. And essentially, the three second rule is. If you allow your logic to kind of overtake something within three seconds, you all of a sudden don't hear the spiritual part that says, yes, this James, this is time for you to make this make this difference. And so the logical piece will always kick in that part of us that plays safe. You know, you have well-meaning people in your life that will say, you know, you should stay in this job because this is what makes sense. This is what you went to school for. So therefore, you should do it. But the three-second rule is essentially if you don't catch it within three seconds and say, well, let me look at this in a different way, how would I be able to reframe this, take the logic aside per se, and then help myself so I don't sabotage myself? Because that, that, that part of us that always wants to stay safe, that is the part that will always cause us to never be able to flourish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think that there's certainly that little voice in our head that continues to hold us back time and time again. And uh, I mean, that's unbelievable that it's just three seconds for that to kick in. 
it's it's really quite interesting. You know, you can even take this on a practical way. Let's say that you have a New Year's resolution and you want to get up at 5 a.m. It's a very ambitious time, and you're going to go to the gym. So all of a sudden, your alarm goes off at 5 a.m., and if you don't get up within three seconds, you will hit that snooze button, and you'll go back to sleep. And so the point is, is anything that we want to do differently, we have to prepare for it. That's why it goes back to, how do I plan for something? If you're going to go to the gym at 5 in the morning, well, then your clothes need to be ready the night before. If you're going to make a, a career change, you need to create all these, uh, to do all your research, because in order to do something, your logic will always kick in within three seconds. And so you have to make a very conscious decision to be aware of how you can self-sabotage within that three seconds. Yeah, absolutely. So awareness being one of the big key words there too. I think that's so important. Yeah. You know, one thing I think is so important is self-actualization. And that's just, you know, a fancy term to basically say, right, what's happening inside of you? Uh, you know, I like to do a lot of check-ins and teach people how to just have a random check-in. You know, you have a create an alarm on your phone. And with that check-in, what you do is when that alarm goes off, you create, <laughs> I really like scale. So on a scale of one to 10, 10, you're doing really well. One, you're not doing well. And so when this random alarm goes off, that's when you check in with yourself to say, well, how am I doing emotionally? How am I doing physically? How am I doing spiritually? And when you can really create that snapshot, it then becomes part of who you are. And then you can always kind of self-monitor. And if you find in the moment that you're not happy with something or you find in the moment that you're perhaps overreacting to a situation, when you have that internal awareness, you can then change it. And I think so many times people just go by rote or they just are so caught up in their daily life that, we're, that they become so reactive and, and they don't even realize that they have the ability to change their situation. They have the ability to change their perspective about something. And so often we just live a very reactive life as opposed to a proactive life. And a proactive life is simply choosing to feel a certain way, choosing to do something different when you have that awareness. And that's you know by simply creating these little scales, these little check-ins that you do every time. So this is probably one of those things where it's like in order to get this habit to stick, you could probably set an alarm on your phone and, you know, at a certain time of day every day, it just says, you know, check in with yourself until you, you know, start to get in the habit of doing that. Because I'm sure after, uh, you know, having that pop up on your phone every day for, you know, two or three weeks, you're going to start doing it yourself. And, exactly. you know, I've certainly found that there are certain situations where, uh, you know, if you can notice that you're moving into a certain emotion, especially in a negative light, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, once you get into that habit of stopping and saying, huh, isn't that interesting? Why am I feeling this way right now? Because exactly. oftentimes we feel something, but we can't quite place it like we can't associate it to what's happening and so mm -hmm. once we can make that connection it's so much easier to move forward and I know a big thing you talk about and you had mentioned earlier was reframing these situations you know it's so easy to go in and say oh my phone broke here's all the bad things blah 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 and just lay it all out on the table how do we switch our minds over to getting into the habit of saying oh here's the really good things that happened today as opposed to just trying to, you know, vomit the terrible things all over the place. <laughs> Definitely. Well, you know, one thing I want to go back just for one second is, did you realize that it's actually 66 times to do something before it becomes a habit? I was taught when I was younger, it was 21 times or something like that, but it's really 66 times. So when you do something for a minimum of 66 times, then it becomes a habit where I think that's how many times when people try and make a change. So let's say they, they try something for two to three weeks and like, ah, it doesn't work. Well, it, it didn't work because you didn't do it enough times to create a habit. Mm, so gotcha. That's just one thing, one thing to just be mindful of. But, you know, I think one of the things when it comes to the reframe is I think it's so interesting because, you know, we've heard the, the cliche or the, the, the term that life is life is always teaching us lessons. Well, that's actually true. And everything we do, the main thing to ask yourself is, what am I learning about myself right now? Let's say you're in traffic and you're driving a car and someone cuts you off. You know, you're often our, our immediate response is going to be very, you know, for some people, very frustrated, very angry or have road rage. But when you can stop and ask yourself, what am I learning about myself right now? And what I typically do is if I find an emotion that I don't really want to feel, let's say if I'm feeling a lot of frustration or anger, I look for its opposite or lack of its opposite rather, which would typically be patience. So in that moment, I say, all right, James, you're angry right now. The lesson it's that you learn could learn or that this is teaching you right now is you're really struggling with patience. So when I reframe the situation and say, ah, this is a perfect time for me to practice patience, it then puts the responsibility or the onus back on me to then say, well, okay, now that I'm aware of that, I can either stay angry 
which is disproportionate because this person doesn't know you, or I can practice this lesson of learning patience and benevolence. And so one of the things to really do is to always ask yourself that, what am I learning about myself right now? And that is something that will always help you kind of have that stop and think, to have that internal reflection to say, oh man, I'm really struggling with this thing here. I'm really struggling with this over here. What do I want to learn about myself? What do I want to teach myself? Because once a situation happens again, you'll have already learned the lesson and it's not going to affect you the way that it did before. Yeah, it's so interesting to look at the opposite, especially when it comes to emotions. And the cool thing about hearing you say this is I have this graphic that I've saved to my phone. And it's quite interesting how the human body works, because not only with emotions, but with your eating habits, I've found that depending on what you're craving, there's actually certain vitamins and minerals and nutrients that you're deficient in. Mm -hmm. And there's this cool chart. I mean, you can find it online for uh it's, you know, just search for like food cravings. But, you know, I crave chocolate all the time. I'm weird <laughs> like too. that. Maybe some other people do it too. Yep. But the crazy thing is this chart shows you if you're craving chocolate, you're deficient in magnesium, which you can get Same. from nuts, seeds, veggies, mm -hmm. fruits, all sorts of things. And it's so interesting to look at the opposite as to, opposed to just focusing on, you know, the negative thing right in front of you. And much like you said, you know, if you hold the quarter closer to you, it's obviously going to take up such a, a larger field of view for you and that's going to be the only thing you can see eventually exactly one thing I really like to do with my clients is I may hold up a book and the way I help them reframe a situation is essentially this I show them this book and I say what do you see of course they tell me what they see on the cover they tell me you know give me all the descriptors and then I say but you but you realize there's another side to it and I'll maybe show them the back cover or open the book up and I'll flip through different pages and it gives it's a really good kind of realization that in every situation there are multiple sides to look at it. You know, with more information that you have, your your perception is going to change. One thing we really teach in psychology is our perception or our belief about a situation determines how we're going to feel. Our feelings then tell our body how to react. And the thing is, when you have more information about something, your belief is going to slightly tilt. It's going you're going to slightly view the situation in, a, in with a different perspective. And that's all of a sudden going to tell your emotions, maybe to have a little bit more emotions in this area, maybe a little bit less in this area, which then tells your body what to do. You know, the chemical reactions that happen, which is the fight or flight, all that as well. So one of the main things to really ask yourself is if I were to have more information, how would I react differently? You know, going back to the whole thing I was saying earlier, we often react in such a quick way. The whole concept of I perceive, I do. But when we can create that slight break or that buffer to simply say, I perceive, do I have enough information? If, you know, that can simply be with clarifying a, a, a situation. You know, for example, if someone says something to me and all of a sudden I, per, I perceive that what they say is, is maybe negative towards me, I could react. But if I simply were to say, could you give me a little bit more information about that? Or what does that word mean for you? And then all of a sudden, that word could be completely different. And I'm like, oh, well, that doesn't really bother me. They just had a different perspective or a different connotation of what that word meant. And so in every situation, we can pause or hold on from that perception to doing and having that little buffer right there to say, do I have all the information? Could I look at this a different way? Did this person mean to, to, to hurt me this way? And when we can have that stop and think, it then gives us the ability to say, well, do I want to feel this way? Or does this really matter to me? Or am I investing too much time and energy in this? So we always have that ability to do it, but it always comes back kind of what I was saying earlier to have this to, to create these self check-ins because when you're able to catch that in the moment you're not going to be as reactive and you'll be able to make the decision and choose how you want to react overall yeah so you know one of the things that I'm thinking about here as you're saying this is that a lot of the stuff that we would need to do and put into place to change our habits and change the way we function takes time and as you and I both know a lot of people want stuff done now yes what can we is you know is there any one little I mean I know there's no loophole with a lot of these things but is there any one little thing that we could do or change or put into place let's say this afternoon that would mm -hmm. start to get the ball rolling at least well, I mean, with, we've talked about many things, but I think one of the biggest things to really focus on is just to simply do a check-in. You know, some of your listeners right now, ask yourself, how am I feeling? Is this something, does this make sense that I'm feeling this way? You know, sometimes we have this agitation or this frustration and we have no idea why. And so when we're able to just really stop and say, do I want to feel this way anymore? 
Yeah, I do. Okay, well, then I'll feel this way. But if I don't, well, then what do I do differently? And sometimes we don't know the causality or for why we feel a certain way. But the point is, it's not so much about processing why I'm feeling this way. It's just simply, I don't want to feel this way anymore. So let me do something different so that I don't feel this way. You know, when we surround ourselves with those things that we love and that we enjoy, it's going to change our life because that's where we're surrounded by things that cause us to to feel a certain way. So I think one of the one of the basic things is just to create that little awareness. I think sometimes we we have this idea of who we want to be and we try and become that person today, but as we know, it's a process. You know, the person I am today was not the person I was, you know, 15 years ago. You know, and every every year, every moment I'm growing and learning more. Sometimes I really flourish and other times, you know, I don't really recognize what the lesson is. And when I don't recognize what the lesson is in that moment, I get to practice it again until I finally get it. And so I think when people can recognize that right this second, we have a choice to figure out how we want to feel. We have a choice to decide what's healthy for us. And we don't have to worry about what's going to happen 10 minutes from now. You know, often when we try and lump everything together, our, our imagination, our fantasy that we create, it kind of kicks in and it stops us from being really present in the moment of saying, what's happening with me now? What's not, not necessarily what's happening with me 10 minutes from now, but when we can really be present in that moment. And I know we hear about that a lot in the media, but truly being able to be present in the moment gives us that ability to say, well, when I can figure out what I'm doing now, now, that's the stepping stone of foundation for how I want to feel in 10 minutes or how I want to feel tomorrow. And so it, it helps us really focus on the moment and really understanding what that looks and feels like. So therefore, it will help us in the next 10 minutes, in the next day. So I think it's safe to say that, you know, regardless of where you are in tuning into the episode, if you're in the car, if you're out for a run, it doesn't really matter. You know, we could sit here all day and listen to podcasts that tell us how to improve, but it doesn't really work until we put it into action. So I'm going to just recommend to the listeners right now, you know, it's so easy to let the podcast run through and it'll just play the next one and the next one kind of like Netflix. And that's how we all end mm -hmm. up binging on House of Cards because it just <laughs> keeps playing. So let's let's say, you know, let's recommend for everyone listening listening right now, you know, after this episode is over, which we're coming to the end here, um, you know, take a little bit, put this on pause, don't let another episode come up and check in with yourself. You know, if you're driving, I think it's probably great to take a little bit of quiet time because you have so much time if you're in the car or if you're out for a run, a walk, whatever. Let's say, you know, take five minutes, maybe set a timer on your phone and just use that time to check in instead of going on to the next episode and actually putting this into place. Yes, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful idea. Well, James, it's really been great having you here. We've got so many great things that we talked about today. What's the best way for people to learn a little bit more about Lifeology? I know we didn't dive uh, a whole lot into what you actually do with it, but I know that there's a lot of great principles you shared here today. And if people like it, I think they should definitely look more into it and possibly working with you. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, they may find me. Um, my website is jamesmillerlifeology.com. That's Lifeology. And so they can find all my information there. I have my own podcasts. I have YouTube episodes. I have an academy that people can sign up for and take some self-directed courses. So there's many, many things there on my website for your listeners to, to perhaps try and check out themselves. Perfect. James, thanks so much for being here. And, you know, is there any, you know, final parting words that you'd like to give to everyone? Well, I think one of the biggest things is just slow down. I mean, we get so caught up and so busy when you just simply slow down and get to know yourself because, <laughs> as you know, you're the person that you're always with all the time. And when you can really understand how you feel and the nuances of who you are, there's nothing that can stop you from being that person you want to be except for you. Mm -hmm. And last thing, where can we find your music? Because I know we didn't get to go into oh. that, but if, <laughs> if people want to find sure. your music. Sure. It's actually on my website as well. The, the first album I created was called uh, Consolation. And my second album, which is called Restoration, will be out April 19th. And so they can find it on iTunes. They can find it on um, any of the digital radio shows or radio, um, radio stores. But they can also find it on, on my website as well. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here today, James. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. It's Zeph. Did you like this episode? Be sure to subscribe so that you can tune in next week and tell a friend about the show. If you want access to free training and exclusive interviews on success, happiness, lifestyle design, and adventure, visit me at yearofpurpose.com. Until next time, go out and let life surprise you so that you can live a life rescripted. scripted